Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Tizolo, and I am the Payments FMI and Industry Head at City. I'm happy to welcome you to this fireside chat today, where we're going to be talking about the future of cross-border payments and how collaboration amongst market infrastructures is going to help get us there. In October of 2020, the Financial Stability Board released their Stage 3 Enhancing Cross-Border Payments Roadmap with improving payments infrastructures as one of their five key focus areas to address the current pain points and the friction in cross-border payments. This roadmap complements many of the payments transformation activities we're seeing emerge across the payments ecosystem. Today, we'll be hearing from Hayes Littlejohn, CEO of EVA Clearing, and Russ Waterhouse, EVP Product and Strategy at Clearing House, on what this all means for our market infrastructures and what role they're looking to play in driving transformation in their communities. So I wanna start a little bit with a bit of a, a provocative question to both of you about the future state and the role of market infrastructures. So we'll start with pretending that we have a crystal ball that's magically gonna show us what the world of payments looks like in 10 years in 20, 2031. What do you think you'll see and what would you want to see? And Russ, we'll, we'll start with you. Okay, well, Melissa, thank you and welcome. Um, so how does how to start that question? So my crystal ball has universally been wrong. Um, so we'll start with that, and especially if you put a 10 year time horizon on it. Um, but maybe as we think about the next 10, we should look back over the last 10 and what we've learned from that. So 10 years ago would have put us in 2011. Um, at that point in time, I think the UK faster payment system is probably the only notable real time instant retail payment system operating. Uh, today, we have 50 plus that are either operating or in, in development stages across the world. Uh, mobile wallets hadn't been discovered, so we didn't have Apple Pay, uh, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, uh, WeChat, uh, Alipay, and the list goes on. Um, we didn't really see yet the emergence of competitors in the cross-border space. Certainly, PayPal was there, but now we've got uh, Wise. It used to be TransferWise, but I guess they rebranded this week. Uh, we've got card push payments, and we've got many other fintechs that are starting to enter the cross-border space. We also had a Libra, which was an interesting start and then not start. Um, but also, domestically, we've seen the rise of e-commerce, tokenization, and open banking. It is just astounding to me how much change has happened over the past 10 years. And many of these initiatives really actually set a platform for a, an acceleration of change. Uh, in the payment system. Certainly that's true, I think, with open banking and APIs and the adoption of APIs. Um, so I think the message from the industry is that the change is, is here, it's, it's accelerating, and that means competition is accelerating. And I think the call for, for all of us as we think about history is, is the history of the planet is evolution, and those that evolve survive and those that don't, don't. And so as an industry, we've got to continue to evolve to survive. So, so I'm, that, I'm not even offering the crystal ball. I'll just give you. I was a about bit. to say that's a very, it's a very um, diplomatic and, and calculated answer. So let's go. Crystal ball. Are you willing to uh, to place a bet on on this? Well, it's funny that we we're still talking about crystal balls in the days of predictive analytics. Um, and you know, I'm not sure that I, I, I have any better answer for the future than, than Russ has. Maybe, maybe look, maybe rather to a, a vision or a dream or a hope. Uh, rather than, than a prediction. And I, I think I would want to see in a globally connected ecosystem with more opportunity and choice than there is today, um, where the friction and pain and paying is removed or reduced, where there's transparency across the processing chain from payer to payee, uh, minimal friction across borders, uh, low cost uh, for consumers end to end, 24-7 uh, with 100% resilience, complete security and data privacy, um, or at least the per data privacy of the choice of the user, and clear and, 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 and complementary roles um, that uh, public and private sector can play in promoting that agenda. Um, what do I think we will see? I think um, some of this will definitely happen. Some other things will probably happen and come in between. Um, I think we will likely to see uh, an increased improvement on the user experience. Uh, especially on the front end. I think we'll make great progress in removing some of the frictions that are there today. Um, I think uh, that the resilience that uh, we've achieved so far is pretty good. 
can be improved and probably will be. Um, not so sure that it's always clear um, in, the, in the coming years how the public and uh, private sectors can work together here, but I'm optimistic. Um, and I think that last but not least, we'll probably still have a few legacy payment instruments around uh, and that we'll still be dealing with uh, despite all of the new normals that are coming. Yeah, no, thank, thank you both. And I, I think, look, both very um, pragmatic and, and, and realistic answers to the question. Um, but again, you know, asking for this future vision or future state, I know it's, it's, it's tough to uh, ascertain, right, what it's going to be like in 10 years from now. Again, to your point, Russ, how much it's changed in the last 10 years. So I'm sure there are things out there that we haven't even considered yet. But, you know, Russ or uh, Hayes actually, um, you know, appreciate you, you know, building out a bit of a vision and what you'd like to see. Um, I think the question is, you know, what role do you think that market infrastructures can play in ensuring that the community, you know, gets to more of this ideal future state? So thanks. I think it's a great question, Melissa. And I think market infrastructures have typically played a role in minimizing investment spend on a collective basis and through cooperation and collaboration are able to help remove some of the frictions and some of the um, the issues that can pop up and work out some issues that um, in, in processing that would, would pop up. Um, also by bringing in common standards and features, coordinating the technology spend, um, defining and if, enforcing some of those roles and responsibilities that are agreed uh, for the participants of the systems uh, that they're, they're operating. Um, I think that also market infrastructures can play a role in resilience, uh, probably also in data privacy and helping improving trust amongst the users. But I think also you, you, the user experience can benefit too uh, with the global standards and global cooperation uh, and also the high system performance and response rates that we've been able to achieve in the real-time payments, instant payment space. Um, there are a lot of competing infrastructure requirements out there that are being driven by competition and some activity in the public sector, like you mentioned, what's going on with the CPMI uh, and trying to bring down the, the global cost of payments. I think those things will also play a role. Uh, and then market infrastructures can help make that efficient. Um, I think though we have to prioritize really well, uh, make sure that senior commitment is available and, and behind uh, some of these initiatives uh, across, across the globe um, and careful not to dance at too many weddings. There's a lot out there and uh, there's a lot of choice and a lot of things we could be spending money on. And if we're not careful, we'll just boil the ocean. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a very a very good way to put it. And I think you know the point that you're making on on resilience is uh, especially astute, considering that a lot of these new market entrants, right, the actual scale and scope of volume and value that they're processing is just a drop in the ocean right, compared to what we have across these existing market infrastructures. So really, when we think about something that's industrial strength, I think absolutely you know a role for uh, a big role for market infrastructures to play there to make sure that global commerce continues when we don't see fails in the space. But also on the, the not dance at too many weddings, I mean, may, maybe also, if, if I may, you know, also realizing when we've got a bad dance partner and, and finding a way to ditch them earlier rather than later in, in a wedding, right, um, is, is probably something also that we need to learn as an industry. I maybe pick up on a point Hayes made right at the start, which I think is a critical point. Um, given where we are in the economic cycle, um, you know, this is if, if we'd have been having this conversation 18 months ago, uh, the banking industry was in a very different place in terms of economics and capital available to invest. And now clearly we're in a very different place. Um, so picking and making the right bets and the right dance partners, I think, can be very, very important because we're competing for capital and resource in the industry. Um, and I and I do think that the industry is going to have to be very selective on on what bets it makes, just because of where we where we are. And that is a great role for an MI. Um, I think there are things that we can do to reduce friction uh, by taking on maybe a little bit more in terms of uh, what we do on an essential basis than might have been traditionally the case, and reduce some of that cost and implementation friction. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you're right. We we provide resiliency with incredibly high dependency. Job one for us is systems we can all depend on that do what they're supposed to do pretty much all the time. I think 99.999, whatever that number is, it's pretty close to perfection and it has to be. Um, I think the flip side to that is that we built domestically some incredible systems with RT1, with RTP, 
So we really do have digital ready platforms now. Um, so we're not dealing with batch. Uh, we're dealing with modern ISO standards and, and we're dealing with modern uh, technology. So that is a great starting point uh, to, to lever into a brave new world, I think. And actually, just to double click on that for, for a second, you know, and, and it's a good point that you bring up that the MIs are already on this path, right? The MIs, you guys have already built these real-time system capabilities, where you've got the experience. So can you talk a little bit about how maybe your infrastructures have adapted um, to build these real-time infrastructures and how you're bringing that into helping to, to influence and play this role in, in making the right bet and finding those right dance partners? I think you know, the, the way that we, we tend to operate really supports that um, through our collaboration and bringing people together to solve certain problems. Um, we have adapted to the changing needs uh, that have come up in the first three years of, of the instant payments world at RT1 through a very active uh, user, uh, user group um, that feeds in its needs as their product and service needs uh, change on the front end. And that's been really, really helpful. We've already had uh, seven iterations of RT1 uh, since it's gone live, um, which is a pretty quick pace for infrastructure. And uh, this has allowed us to, to get ready. And the other thing that we've done um, that we've leveraged the infrastructure for that I think will uh, play a role in, in removing some of the frictions down the road is the, um, the request to pay. And uh, we've developed this on the, on the rails of, of um, RT1 using a lot of the same components. Um, and as Russ was mentioning before, you know, that, that what we've built and what we've discussed so far here, what we've built is really ready for basically any type of use case. Um, the scale of RT1 right now, uh, it was built to process 5,000 transactions per second, which is uh, on, on par with any credit card uh, um, processing that you have today and can handle peaks that you, you would see in, in, in big shopping days. So I think it provides a real, uh, together with request to pay, requires, provides a real opportunity uh, to, to improve on, on what we've gotten. So we've adapted in that way, along with our user needs and our users are what drive us. Thanks, Hayes. Uh, Russ? Yeah, I'd, I'd echo the request for payment. Um, I think that is a game changer. It, it's, you know, it's, we've operated for a long time as an industry based on debit products, certainly, certainly here in the US. So we think about ACH debit, debit card, et cetera. And all of those require the exchange of customer credentials, sensitive credentials. And I think the, the huge advantage of RTP is, is credit push. And, and the way you get around a debit, that request for payment, can be done in a very secure way through a banking channel. So we do think that's a, a huge game changer uh, in terms of safety, transparency, and consumer control. Um, and it actually brings the consumer or the, or the business back to the bank, right? So they're, they're not transacting uh, with, with the corporate, they're actually coming back to the bank to transact, which is hugely important. Um, I, I do think that is one of the things that surprised me in the RTP journey, and Hayes touched on it, uh, it was how market infrastructures would traditionally just build the tech and, and the banks would go away and build product and innovate on top of it. But the complexity, uh, which is good for RTP and RT1, uh, is you've got way more messaging capabilities and therefore way more product capabilities. And so we found ourselves in a role of facilitating conversations around product development in ways that we didn't anticipate. Uh, and I think that's a good muscle for us to further develop. So as we think about this cross-border space, uh, you know, how the, the innovation that's going to be required uh, and how we innovate together, I think, is going to be hugely important. And, and so we've actually invested significantly in our product team internally here uh, to help drive innovation with the banks as partners. Well, that's, that's great. Thank, thank you both. And um, yeah, and I asked the question because I think sometimes we forget how innovative we've actually been as an industry, and particularly the market infrastructures with this to real-time instant payments. I mean, it's a very significant change over the past 10 years. And uh, as you both mentioned, you know, has required a real shift in mindset with your own organizations and also has spurred a lot of development from the broader ecosystem in the banks. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask about the other innovations, right, that, that have been taking place across the cross-border payments ecosystem. Um, and your thoughts around the ones that excite you the most, right? So we've got 
this migration to ICO 20 or 22 at a large scale across the broader industry, GPI, the SWIFT platform, this exploration of more 24 by seven, which again, I think goes back to this, you know, instant payment schemes, but thinking about that more broadly in, in, in the high value space as well. A movement towards usage of APIs, more dynamic interaction between, between banks. Uh, and even, you know, questions around digital currency and CDBC. So I uh, wanted to ask both of you, I mean, which of these really excites you most? Um, and which ones do you think are perhaps more hype than substance? And uh, Russ, we'll start with you. I think GPI has been tremendous for the industry. It's done two things. It's, one is it's provided transparency. Uh, so I think there was always this notion that cross-border interbank payments were slow. Uh, and burdensome, and, and I think what GPI has proven, either by just the transparency it's given into that window, is that it's really quite fast and efficient. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of public shaming there too that's helped the industry improve. So I think GPI has been has been very healthy and a great step forward for the industry. Uh, as I think about the others, ISO, you know, ISO has huge promise. Uh, all of these new instant payment systems are being built on ISO. Um, so we, that provides us a common building block uh, where we actually can build uh, interaction between message exchange between the systems. Um, I think 24-7 is the other huge one for me. I think historically a constraint of all market infrastructures was they tended to operate on the business day of that country. And 24-7 and obviously gives us access to the globe all the time. And so to me, those are really two of the most important building blocks that we've, we've put in place to facilitate cross-border. Thanks, thanks, Russ. So hey, is, uh, over to you, I guess, which of, of these weddings are you going to attend and which ones are you going to uh, send your polite decline to? Well, some of them we may not have any choice about um, and that <laughs> include CBDC. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not sure it's um, it, it, what to what point it, the, it's needed and, and where it's going to be used. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not entirely clear in uh, central banking community either. There's quite a diversity of opinion on that. Um, if it comes, of course, we'll adapt to that. If, but it will be another wedding that we'll have to dance at and will re require some effort and some some um, spend. So. Um, We'll see where that leads. I'm at, at this point, I'm a little bit uh, doubtful about the immediate application of that. Maybe longer term, it could be interesting. And in my view, probably in the, first in the wholesale space and, and second in the resale space. But there are other factors out there that I think drive the central banks to be very interested in that. Um, but I would say that uh, you know both the dollar and the euro are already very digital. So you know, to just to create a, a central banking digital currency is additional and complementary to what's already there. And uh, you know what we process is 100% digital, and you know we're doing it 60 million times a day, um, and I think that's uh, already working in terms of scale and reach and uh, and resilience. So I think that's that's something good. Um, of the other points, I think 20, I agree with Russ. 24/7 ISO are super enabling, um, and just having those and combining them together with some of the other things we've talked about, request to pay, for example, uh, GPI transaction manager and, and, and putting those building blocks together in kind of an end-to-end -end global processing chain can be really interesting and can really allow a, a, a new kind of frictionless end-to-end uh, -end payment processing. So I'm pretty excited about that too. Yeah. Great, thanks. I'd echo the thought on the, C, on the central bank digital currency. It's been a fair bit of press on the side of the Atlantic recently. Um, and. And you say, hey, it it's, it's, could be complementary. I actually think it compete, It actually creates complexity. Um, at the end of the day, it is we, we have digital today. And so it's just a new digital pool. So it creates another liquidity pool. Um, and for most people, uh, consumers or businesses, what's the difference? It's a claim on the central bank versus a claim on the commercial bank. Um, it, it, to me, it's very complicating. And, and I'm really kind of skeptical as to what value it adds. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Russ. And I think it was a lot of those points were also made in the in the paper that came out last year from the ECB, uh, where they are trying to understand what the different roles could be. And uh, you know, I, I think there's really, in my view, a probably a role to play um, in in the cash space because I think they're trying to understand what happens with cash. And as 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 the issuers of cash, uh, there's a, a clear interest there. But you know, once you've done that. And you start to apply it everywhere, or, or want to apply it everywhere because you've invested in that. Uh, that's where I think the confusion can come in. 
and maybe even you know if 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 uh, a lot of hype and activity is spent there, it could divert from other valuable and maybe more value creating activities that we could be doing. Yeah, and I think there's a key lesson there. Um, I can, you know I can reflect back on the U.S. experience with same day ACH. The industry has invested a lot of money on same day ACH pretty much at the same time it was investing in RTP. And, and it's pretty obvious as to what the better product is, um, but a huge investment was made in both. Um, and, and one wonders, was that the best use of funds? So we don't have, I don't think we have the luxury of those decisions going forward. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a really good point and, and really good dialogue um, you know, from both of you. Um, I, I think the point then is, back to the you know when do you ditch your dance partner right because i think all of these things we're probably exploring right we're, we're, we're looking at what are the right areas that we want to take our bets on um but i think you know russ to your point right we can't do everything and is it the best usage of all of our, our time and effort and investment dollars um to try to do everything and the answer there is, is probably no um okay so then I guess, you know, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about collaboration, right? Because I think perhaps this also gets to the point of making our bets together um, and moving forward together as an industry, right? Because the, the reality is that the cross-border payments ecosystem as it exists today is, is made up of many different players. And in order to really move forward and innovate, we all have to kind of move forward together, right? And if we're not making the same bets, if we're not making the investments in the right places, then we could you know, end up being, um, you know, quite confused and disorganized, right, with how things move forward. So one of the biggest benefits of this model, though, is that it provides ubiquity of payments across the globe, right? So all of these players coming together, um, you know, really gives this ability to make payments anywhere, um, which you don't get with, you know, the new closed loop ecosystems and some of the, the, the new um, networks and fintechs coming on the scene. Um, but we also need to make sure that to retain this benefit, this ubiquity of payments, everybody needs to move forward together um, across different jurisdictions about, uh, you know, and across different infrastructures as you two represent um, different infrastructures. So can you tell us a little bit about how you are collaborating together to move forward together? Um, and Hayes, we'll, we'll start with you with this one. Okay. Yeah, um, so the Clearinghouse and, and EBA Clearing have uh, quite a, a few common, commonalities in their structure, their governance, uh, and there are some institutions that are also shareholders in, in, in both, uh, both companies. And so, you know, that creates a kind of a, a way for the two to naturally come together to talk about certain things that might be um, of relevance to, to, to both sides of, of the Atlantic. Um, and I think also many of our, our objectives uh, line up. For example, um, RTP and RT1 were launched within weeks of each other. Uh, this, uh, maybe it's coincidence, uh, probably not. Um, I think it, but this, all of this together facilitates collaboration generally. And so um, I think there's been a natural discussion going on over the last few years about ways that, that uh, the infrastructures might work together. I think both also play a role in helping their participants collaborate in, in the standards-based, non-competitive space uh, to help bring down costs and improve efficiencies. And I think with some common objectives, uh, like for example, to remove friction or improve transparency globally, uh, there's a, we have a great chance to get certain key stakeholders for Euro and US dollar around the table and work out possible solutions which can represent the two biggest currencies in the world and which can be expanded to others. Um, I think in this process, there's a great opportunity to leverage some of those other things that we were talking about before, other build, building blocks that are that are now been around and have been around for a little bit and are also maturing, uh, like uh, Swift GPI. Um, I think the transaction management platform could also play a role in here, and I think that's something we should look at. Um, and I think that in the end, though, it, it, it's, it has to be something that the participants um, and the banks that are, are using the, our systems uh, want and can use uh, without reinventing the wheel. Thanks very much for that, Hayes. So, Russ, over to you. I think Hayes is absolutely right. I mean, one of the things we do is we bring our members together. I mean, our purpose beyond just running those systems is to help them innovate. And it's a forum for collaboration. And in, that, in doing so, we can bring some of the brightest minds in the industry together, um, which I think is hugely valuable. 
And they also represent a, a diverse set of stakeholders. Uh, so we can get diverse views in the room, which is also very beneficial. It comes with a challenge, I think, because when you've got diversity of view and business model, uh, it's hard to get alignment. Um, but I think that's part of the challenge of having these conversations. And so, so today we're, we're working together to try to get some alignment on, on how we might move forward with the cross border. Uh, I think the biggest challenge we're going to face in that is being bold enough. Um, I think when you're, when you're building consensus, there's a natural tendency to go to the mean. And, you know, the mean is, is great sometimes, um, but it's hardly bold. Uh, and I think, you know, as we th go back to that first question today, I think we're in a place where it calls for bold action, not the mean. Um, but I do think that, that, you know, the constituencies that we represent uh, and bring together uh, have what it takes to, to make those bold decisions. Well, thank, thanks for that, Ross. It's getting everybody to sort of sing the, the same tune, right? Not, that's not always easy, um, even in the, the, the best of circumstances, right? But here we're talking about not just your own communities, but your communities working together across different jurisdictions. Um, so Russ, maybe you could just double click on that a, a little bit more on the role that you see, you know, your market infrastructure playing and in kind of wrangling the community, right? And, and, and getting to that, that bold um, vision, as you yeah. said. Yeah. I think that it starts, do we have a common view of what the, what the challenge is? Um, so do we, do we agree uh, that there is a near and present danger or clear and present danger, I guess is the better way to describe it, um, and a rallying cry to actually change. I think the next question is, so if we believe that change is needed, and so the question is why and what's the end state, and there, there I think you've got to look at it through the eyes of the customer, and that's something that's a unique ability for the banks, right? That's not a natural ability for the market infrastructure. Um, so as you start to look at it through the eyes of the customer, whether it's a corporate or a consumer, I think that's really where you have to start in terms of what's the ultimate objective and, and work backwards from there. Um, so, so I do think you know, we're, that's a process that we have to go through and hopefully we get to a place where there's a very strong, bold consensus. Um, and then the next question is, you know, can we rally around that? Um, and I think the good news is that you know, both of our organizations have senior representation. And, and so, it's, so we can take this to the top of the house and the banking community and actually uh, look for support there, which I think is going to be essential because the other challenge that I think you'll see in any change like this is the power of incumbency. Uh, and incumbents are strong and there's incumbents within banks. And, and so the incumbency will fight against change. Um, and for that, it really does take somebody who's looking at an enterprise level uh, to support the change. So that's a haze. Yeah, I think I would echo the points that, that Russ made also before, which is that the, in, in order to be bold enough, there has to be a vision that, has, that is willing to take a risk um, and a risk of breaking things um, that are working really well um, in the understanding and uh, belief that, that creating new things is, is going to be good and um, really valuable. And I think that's, that's hard because there's a lot of inertia uh, in the industry and, and along customer solutions that are, are currently in place and they work really well. And a lot of people would say, well, why change? It works great. But there are a couple of things we've talked about the regulatory push, but there's also some competitive push for, for a number of institutions that are driving them to have to innovate and find solutions that, that can drive um, consumer behavior in a positive direction and a, and a really good user experience. And I think, you know, when the industry responds, in a, a, um, in, a, in a global and a, in a thoughtful way and is ready to be uh, a little bit bold. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to actually be a little bit bold here. Um, and then take a couple of uh, chances and leverage what we've got. We can create something truly uh, amazing. Yeah, I, one thing to avoid, I think, is the quick fix. Uh, you know, I think if we look back to the history of banking, uh, here's a shiny new product and we can roll it out and we've got this spaghetti of technology in the background and we'd layer in the quick fix and the spaghetti bowl just got bigger, um, but we got something out the door. As opposed to sometimes you really do need to take that fresh piece of paper. And I think our team one and, and RTP represent that opportunity to have true straight through processing. Um, so, so I think we have to resist the quick fix a little bit too.
Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with that statement. Um, you know, the, sometimes uh, you have quick fixes that are in place for ten or fifteen years, in uh, some cases uh, even longer. And uh, if we're not careful, then you know, getting there quickly could could lead to suboptimal results. And I think that's that's really important. And I think it's also really important at the points that we decided before that we mentioned before in terms of keeping focus and not dancing at too many weddings, ditching the bad dance partners that are that are not uh, not good dancers or not getting you forward. Um, and the tricky thing is, you know, what if that's uh, you know Aunt Aunt uh, Nelly that uh, might get a little bit uh, offended by that, but uh, sometimes uh, Aunt Nelly might have to have an understanding. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Sometimes you have to be a bit controversial with these things, but on, on that point, right? Um, you know, maybe in the the spirit of perhaps being a little bit controversial, but I think that the willingness is actually there to make these bold changes, right? We're talking about the bold versus the incremental and, and trying to, you know, wake the, the broader industry and ecosystem up to really be bold or not be incremental, not fall into those past habits. Do you think that willingness is there? Uh, please, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, Melissa, I do actually think that there is a, a, a broad willingness um, to, to do some of this change and take it forward. I think that um, the time is quite ripe. You have a number of, of, of factors converging, pressures converging. And I think um, it is there. Again, the, the, the thing is focus. Um, and I think there are different perceptions of the different stakeholders, whether they're banks, regulators, or customers on the speed of change or even the need to change um, that need to take into account. Um, but the willingness, I think, is there. Um, I think what and why we need to change is, is, is getting clearer all the time. I, I think a lot of factors have been brought up in different reports coming out. Um, exactly how to get there and how much it's going to cost and what value it brings. This is still something that, that the, the participants are exploring. Um, and on a general note, we need to also keep in mind that you know various payment systems that are that are operated around the world have unique properties and, 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 and value propositions. And whilst the technology might come together and standards might come together to create efficiencies, um, you know, banks have to decide you know, how fast versus how liquidity efficient things need to be. Um, they need to understand also where they want to make trades in order to uh, optimize this product or that product. So I think um, the, the, the future is bright um, and the willingness is there, um, provided we can keep ourselves focused on the future. Yeah, all right, lots of positivity. So Russ, over to you. I, no, I, it, I think this is the bank's game to, to, to lose, in my view. Um, so you've, you've got the footprint today. You've got the DDA. Um, you, you've got these new building blocks that we put in place. I think there's every reason to believe that banks can succeed and should succeed. Um, I think the other one they've got is trust. And so when we think about the, the Libra as an example, um, and other large tech platforms that, that have huge scale, uh, which is a tremendous advantage. In many cases, they lack trust. Um, and I do think that that's not something we should never underestimate. Um, so I think we do have the, the right to win here, and I think we, sh we could and should. Um, so, so I'm very optimistic, to be honest. That's great, right? Great to hear some optimism from, from both of you on this. So look, in, in closing out, um, and, and maybe this also goes to that point about trust, right? The trust is there because we've got ecosystem and regulatory, uh, regulatory landscape and compliance landscape that's all built towards creating something that's very industrial strength that meets requirements that um, is aligned with the different jurisdictional views around the world and governments around the world. And you know, while, while that creates this very you know, industrial strength ecosystem uh, that can handle these large payment volume and values, I guess there are also friction points, right? That these differences that you could have are this very complex overall view um, from a regulatory and, and standards perspective can, can create. So I guess how, how could, um, global policy makers like CPMI, what could they do to do more to help standardize or embrace some of the modern technologies that are out there and remove some of these friction points that emerge from the fact that we're dealing with lots of different, you know, structures and requirements and jurisdictions around the world. And Russ, we will start with you on this one. So I think 
I think the first thing that GPI or CPMI, sorry, have done that I think is right in the G20 is it's a call for action. And so I, I think that and competitive pressures are, are hugely helpful in terms of helping the industry move forward. Uh, I think their motivations are also right. Um, so a lot of it is around just more efficient payment systems, which helps GDP, it's financial inclusion. These are all very positive things and, and we support them. I think the risk that, that CPMI runs is it, it views the world through the lens of a regulator. Um, so I'll go back to where I was a minute ago, which is it really has to be the end user uh, that is driving the outcomes here, uh, not the regulator. And so there aren't any silver bullets. Right? This is this is going to be hard work, and and most of the work is going to have to be on the backs of the private sector, um, whether that's the technology, the user experience, the the legal constructs, um, you know, the risk models. All of that is is something that the private sector is going to have to wrestle with. Um, so so I would kind of implore the CPMI to to not get in the way of what we need to do in terms of interfacing with and understanding the customer challenge um, and help us in some of the things which are theirs, right? And so, so clearly cross-border transactions today, the biggest point of friction is, is the regulatory overhang uh, that attaches to those payments. And that's the place I think they can help. Thanks for that, Russ. So Hayes? I, I, I couldn't agree more on, on, on those points. I, I think the, um, the private sector has a, a, a big role to play in, in making it happen and putting the technology in place and putting the standards and processing and, and, and rules in place to make it all work. Um, and I think we don't need a whole lot of help on that um, other than to just keep the focus. But I think the, uh, the, the biggest thing that the, the private sector and especially um, bodies like C, CPMI or FSB who have an interest in financial inclusion and I've written a, a very lengthy report on this, uh, is to really take some of the big frictions which, which the participants have these days, which is around anti-money laundering and sanction screening, where in every country, every jurisdiction, it can, it's different, the standards are different. And so even finding technology to deal with that, that's, it's out there. Uh, but where a lot of value could be created is in, in harmonizing some of those and creating uh, the ability to do some more processing at the center rather than all, always at the end. And I think that would remove a lot of cost and a lot of concern that um, industry players have in uh, handling transactions correctly um, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned the other day, Hayes, was, was safe harbor. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's going to be, it, it's, it's a tough thing, for, I think, for the regulators to, to get their heads wrapped around because they like to strangle lots of throats. Uh, when things go wrong, um, but technology has evolved. And, and I think the regulatory framework and landscape needs to evolve with it. And, and a lot can be done at the center that is, that is impossible to do at the endpoints. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that folks can embrace that. And, and as Hayes said, safe harbor is, is key to that. Yeah, I think safe harbor is something that have been talked about for a long time, and maybe it's the time wasn't ripe in the past, but uh, with the technologies that are out there and models of global supervision, global um, oversight that are in place for different uh, entities, including SWIFT, uh, CLS, and others, I think there could be an opportunity to create, even in the AML and, and sanction space, a kind of agreement that could be applied uh, globally and uh, still be adaptive. And I think that's uh, some of the um, challenges for the future, also for the public sector, is to, to try to make that happen to, to enable this. It sounds like, sorry, go ahead, Russ. Uh, sorry, just a, a one last point. I mean, there's, there's models ex existing in the world today that at the center have, have clearly identified a path to be much more effective than, than the current approach. So I think we've got to shine some light on that and, and help the regulators get to that place, I would hope. So it sounds like a willingness to kind of be open-minded, right, and not that stuck in our preconceived notions around how these specific things should work, but there might be more efficient ways of doing it in a centralized way than you know, um, non-centralized as, as it exists today might be the best way to approach this. But a willingness for also the regulators and um, you know, uh, the bodies like CPMI to also help uh, echo the importance of being open-minded uh, when trying to tackle these, these issues. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so 
that brings us to the end of our chat today. So thank you both very much for your time. I think a very, very enlightening conversation. Um, appreciate both of your time. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Very much appreciate it.